Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Queen Cream, your resident whore-loving, pole-dancing drag queen. This is the first installment in a never-ending series I plan to pursue, Working the Lore Corner, where I, Queen Cream, provide you a little drag story time of a particular video game, movie, or TV show, while, of course, spicing up the flavor for my girls, gays, and theys. Let's dive on in! Resident Evil Remake was released in 2002 and, as the name implies, is a direct remake of Resident Evil from 1996. As the first entry in the franchise, we are jumping in right away and soaking up the story as it is splooged to us. Right off the bat, the game gives you the choice of playing as Chris Redfield, an ex-Air Force girly who now lives in Raccoon City, working for the police department's STARS unit. Or Jill Valentine, an ex-former Army sister, General Private Lieutenant Colonel Top Dog Sergeant that learned how to Houdini her way through any lock and has so much bomb defusal knowledge she'd put any Call of Duty search and destroy match to shame. She also now serves for STARS. Playing as Chris is often seen as the true way to play Resident Evil Remake as he has two less inventory slots than Jill, but can handle more hits from the zombies, but unfortunately suffers from not nearly being as cunty as Jill, but oh well, we are still going to play as Daddy Chris first. Even though this is the 2015 HD remaster on Xbox Series X, you know we have got to play as authentically as possible, so we set the display to wide, the controls to original, because you know I love them sweet, sweet tank controls, and have subtitles on because my deaf ass does not know what they're saying if I'm eating anything like chips. Immediately, our alpha team finds themselves in this spooky forest, and we hear that Bravo team is MIA. Bravo team of what? That would be the STARS unit, Special Tactics and Rescue Service, a specialized police force that this random-ass city named after a rodent has their citizens' tax dollars paying for. See, Bravo team was sent here here to investigate a strange noise or something. The STARS unit must be underfunded because literally 15 seconds after they touch the ground, this dipshit named Joseph Frost gets mauled by a dog instead of shooting it with his gun. And then the second the helicopter pilot, Brad Vickers, sees this, he straight up dips. <laughs> Since these puppies are hungry as fuck and looking for a new Happy Meal, they start chasing after the rest of our team, Alpha Team. We are hoofing it through the forest. Not one person trips, by the way, so kudos to them, Mama, for not giving in to that horror cliche. Suddenly, we stumble on a multi-million dollar mansion just up here, chilling in the Arclay Mountains. Once we are in the beautiful and well-lit mansion foyer, the three stars members from Alpha Team who are still alive decide to split up. We'll split up. I'll take the girls this way. We've got the team captain, Albert Wesker, who wears sunglasses both at night and indoors, and Jill Valentine, the other character we get the chance to play as at the start. But don't worry, we will get to Mother's Story later. And of course, ourselves, Chris Redfield, the best damn shooter the Force has to offer. I've heard he's good with guns, too. Since everyone more separate ways. Chris finds himself in an elegant dining room that always reminds me of the dinner scene from Clue. Hi. Sorry. I'm a little bit accident prone. Oh, watch it. Armed with nothing but a knife, he finds an ink ribbon on the table. For Gen Z, that is something you put in a typewriter that would allow the keys to hit the ink and transfer letters onto the page. What's that? There's a typewriter right behind us. This is how we save our game. Easily. One of the most baller save methods in a video game ever. Tiptoeing down into the next room and down the hall, he is greeted with the whitest zombie, absolutely eating a man out in the middle of the floor like this were Saturday night at the Eagle. I guess we know what happened to Bravo team. Since we only have a William Sonoma pairing knife with us, Chris nopes the fuck out of there and back to the foyer. Jill and Wesker are gone. Out of sight, out of mind. But what is in sight? A nice, beefy handgun. There's only 15 bullets, but we will be staying strapped in these trying times. Heading east, he sees some shiny looking pot and does something Dora the Explorer wishes she could achieve. Map, find the map, find the map. Peeking into the hallway, he finds a dagger. Watch out, zombies, because I bite back. Well, time to put it to good use. Take that, zombitch! You are foiled by furniture. 
Now that he's got some firepower and a slight idea how to navigate Kevin McAllister's home, he heads back in the direction of the zombie who was doing what I wish I was doing, taking a bite out of some dude. He's ready to face him, but he's not there. It's just a corpse of our comrade Kenneth, but luckily he left his sex tape behind, so Chris has got to find a VCR to see the goods. Now that he's got some actual pot, he just has to find the bong to smoke it out of. Now upstairs, Chris finds a golden arrow with an emerald head attached to it. That's a surprise tool that can help us later. Luckily, that loops him back to the upper balcony of the dining room. Immediately, Chris takes notice of a statue with a glowing item inside and a convenient break in the balcony railing to push it down. Let's see what dropped. Never mind, our inventory is full. We'll come back later. At the landing of the grandiest grand staircase that would put the Titanic to shame, honey, is a painting that is actually a hidden door leading to a makeshift cemetery, hopefully of the pet variety. He sees an ominous looking tomb that claims to need an arrowhead to unlock. Gee, I wonder where we can get one of those. Luckily, Chris doesn't skip leg day and makes it down the world's largest staircase with ease. Down at the Earth's core is some book, and since Chris is a nerd, he wants to take a look and read it. The book tells of four evil masks he has to find. The ghost face, the bleached William Shatner, the hockey mask, and the leather face skin mask. Apparently, if we can secure the precious cargo, this is some scary shit, will happen. Even better than some whack-ass Ave Due Dembala is a key. Now he can really start exploring this mansion. The first door that has a sword emblem carved into the doorknob is just upstairs. In this hallway, there's a big hunk of wood. With no option to duck walk and chop it in half, he stashes it in his inventory. Carrying on through the only way available and passing up a bunch of items, but that's because we have just found our first save room. In here, we are safe from all outside threats that could possibly dare take a swing on us. So we throw some of our unnecessary items into the endless box that conveniently teleports around the mansion. Chris also finds a note that says he best be roasting these dead ass zombies because they will be back unless we scorch. One of the benefits of playing as Christopher is that he has the lighter as his default item. So the flask of kerosene only takes up one inventory slot as opposed to playing as Jill where they each take up a slot in the main inventory. Using his newfound pyro techniques, he torches the zombie he just brained right outside of the safe room. He stumbles across a fireplace, and since we've got that lighter, you know what we do. But wait, there's more. He places that hunk of wood on the slot above the fireplace, and it burns a copy of the map into that hunk of wood. Hot damn. Now we can navigate the second floor like a pro. Heading back to that room with the zombie he cockblocked with the dresser, Chris can now open the other door here and wind up in the second rendition in one of gaming's most famous hallways. Noticing that only two of the cabinets in this hallway are pristinely textured in glorious 3D leads him to believe that he can push them out of the way and find some goodies. He stumbles upon a grotesque looking door, and since we don't know shit about unlocking, we have to use these items called old keys. After hearing a door sound effect that would be used again in Resident Evil's 4 and 5, he finds some teenager named Kyle's stash of herbs and some plant chemicals. We're just going to ignore the angry looking Dobermans outside these gates though. He rudely interrupts a zombie doing some self-help, but it's worth it since he was hiding another old key in there that we can replace the previous one with. Trucking along, we find ourselves a new toy, a shotgun. Now the zombies will be no match for the Chrisinator. Unfortunately, Chris's gorgeous ass shook the room too hard and made the roof start collapsing. I guess we aren't getting that shotgun just yet. The game was merely teasing us, but little do they know, I'm now extremely enticed because I'm into that shit. Across the mansion, there's a door whose lock is looking a little rustic, so he uses that zombie streamer's bathwater old key to pry our way inside. In here, he finds a broken shotgun. The old bait and switch. Take that, stupid ceiling trap. Clearly, John Kramer was not commissioned to make this. Now that he's locked and loaded, we get absolutely wrecked by a 22-year-old jump scare we have gone through multiple times in our lives, seen in multiple discussions, and yet here we are. Effective. Back in that hallway with the iconic first zombie is a staircase leading to a kitchen. It's the last door in the mansion that requires the sword key. So we ditch that hoe like it was Roxy Andrews at the bus stop. 
He finds another old key, but before we leave, we see a POV of a zombie trying to be slick on us, but we execute that motherfucker and move on. Back by the save room with the medicine, he opens up another jank door using an old reliable old key to B and E our way inside. After opening up a shortcut, Chris realizes that it's time to look for another key, as he searched all he can for now. Back in that room where we had to pass up a bunch of items because our inventory was full earlier, there's a dog whistle. On the mansion balcony he just opened up with that shortcut, Chris blows the whistle and miraculously lives. Well, well, well. Look who comes running. After he steals that dog's Cartier Couture collar and finds a little coin inside. Back in that scary hallway with the arrowhead and weed, there was one more door Chris didn't quite explore in there. Yo, what the fuck is that? Ignoring that crimson head who just arose, he finds the armor key. But fuck, Jigsaw, I mean, Trevor Chambers, strikes again, and a knight is coming to kill Chris in a death trap. But seeing the coin and the key next to each other in Chris's inventory makes him realize there might be more to this coin than at first glance. It pops open into an imitation key, and we have bamboozled the traps once more. Around the corner from the save room with the medicine is a narrow hallway with a tiger statue claiming she needs some blue and yellow light. Oh, oh, that blue Swarovski crystal lying on the dining room floor. You remember her? Uh, let's, uh, yeah, let's slippery slip slip slide that right on in there. Oh, come on, shotgun shells. In the room across from Joe Exotic, he finds a zombie playing seven minutes in heaven and a note about some super kinky sex. Itchy, tasty, as well as our good friend, the old key. Further down is Audrey too, and a place to put some chemicals. Good thing he found some weed killer earlier. Putting that in the water sprays toxins all over the plant, allowing Chris to effectively maneuver within any given situation. It's a death mask. Let's go put her where she belongs. Oh, uh, okay. After placing the death mask in the underground tomb, he investigates the last door upstairs of the mansion foyer. He finds Forrest Speyer as a corpse. He was from Bravo Team. Of course, he turns into a zombie and we're forced to put him down for good. Forrest has slayed for the last time. Until I play one dangerous zombie. Ugh. Meanwhile, up by the save room, Chris encounters two members of Bravo Team, and they're alive! Miss Rebecca Chambers, the 18-year-old medic, and Richard Aiken, who is in bad shape yapping about being bit by a big ol' snake. We gotta get his ass serum right away. Luckily, it's in the save room with the medicine, so he gives it to Dick here, and luckily he's feeling like he just left the Abbey on a Saturday night. He's okay. He's just unconscious. Chris leaves Rebecca to her own devices, so he sets out to the room by where Richard had to make the story all about him for a second. Ah, but it's too dark in here. It is dark upstairs and I am frightened of the dark. Will anyone go with me? Luckily, we got that base kit lighter, so we're in the know now. Chris gets a musical score. Well, if we venture back to the area by the tiger statue, we find another door locked by the armor key, and there's a piano inside. Things are starting to make sense. On the shelf in the same room, he finds the rest of the musical score, giving us a complete sheet music. Chris ain't know how to bell Beethoven, but luckily, Queen Rebecca Chambers comes to the rescue to deliver a heart-wrenching performance of Moonlight Sonata. was that? Sis fumbled the bag at the very end, though, and she says she needs some practice. So we go looking for another objective while we let her cook. Let's meddle into this room with a big iron door. Ah, a puzzle. It would appear that if we push the statues inward in the order depicted on the wall, we could possibly see some successful results. Huzzah! Chris said, Can I get a box? 
By pressing some heart-shaped switches, this unlocks the jewelry box and gets us our second death mask. Into the cave it goes. We're getting real close to cut this evil out of him. It seems like that was enough time for Rebecca to rehearse the house down boots, serving us a performance so inspiring the walls moved. Inside is an emblem we need, but in order to successfully pull off this heist, we're going to have to pull a Debbie Ocean and switch the real one with a fake. Luckily, Chris has walked past the emblem above the fireplace in the dining room several times and knows that's got to be the answer. Placing the gold emblem above the fireplace causes the clock in the room to bust her pussy open for some Kohl's cash. Flangling the gears, the clock reveals herself to have the shield key. There's only one door in the mansion where the shield key is used, and it's right where Richard had to have his moment. On the way to grabbing the shotgun, we have a run-in with Rebecca, who fills us in that most of the medical equipment in this mansion is from a company called Umbrella, a Raccoon City-based pharmaceutical company. After ditching the shield key, we're greeted to Chris nabs the death mask in the corner of the room and heads for the door, but not before the snake. He got off one shot at you. The snake has some chomps, so Chris passes the fuck out and we play as Rebecca briefly to save his ass. Back to fetching some serum again. Rebecca hits Chris with the Pulp Fiction kit and he's off to place that third death mask. In the first save room, the one without the medicine, it seems our good Judy Wesker has left Chris some supplies. What a good captain he is looking out for us. In the room above the save room, there's a mounted deer head and a banger soundtrack right out of Luigi's Mansion. Seriously, tell me this is not right out of the video game Luigi's Mansion on the GameCube. There's two doors in here, one wide open that has some supplies, and the other one that requires our trusty old, old key. Good thing there's an old key just lying in this other room over here. Really? Oh, that's incredibly convenient. Even though we still have one in the magic box. Using the old key renders Chris in a makeshift lab, and we gotta get to work Frankensteining some bugs. Once he puts everything in the right spots, he discovers a little crest as the resident evil bug comes to life and tries to stop us. Chris stashes the wind crest for now, since we aren't quite ready to use it. Right around the corner through a shoddy doorknob is the last door to use the armor key on. Inside is a mural of a G-O-D-D-E-S-S. -S. That bitch is a goddess. Wearing some bedazzled jewelry. Long story short, we make some stained glass match her stained rocks and the walls open, serving us our fourth and final death mask. Using the last old key, we break out of this gate, opening up another shortcut and leading right to the cave to place the last mask, starring Julia Stiles. Now that all the mask queens are on go, the proverbial coffin drops, locking Chris inside to face a crimson head and... These bitches on some other shit. He blasts the fucker to kingdom come, grabs the stone and metal object, and gets the hell out of there. We could place the stone and metal object on the basement doors, but we still need one more. So Chris takes it back to the gated area behind the broken door. Inside, Chris finds a healthy set of supplies and starts messing with some wind vanes when he gets a shaky radio call warning him of imminent danger. Being the main character, he pushes along until he reaches some gravestones asking for a crest and mentioning the wind blowing. Hmm, that sounds familiar. He places the wind crest we got from role-playing the B-movie into the gravestone and voila! So many crests, Colgate wouldn't know how to handle themselves. Chris figures out that these new crests must go in the gravestone located two feet away from this one, and we are rewarded with a signature Resident Evil calling card classic, the Magnum. That's a surprise tool that can help us later. I mean, seriously, look at how sleek and sexy this gun looks. Absolutely stunning presentation on the runway today. Listen, listen, real life guns? Absolutely not. No way, Jose. There's no reason to have this in real life. But video game guns where we are living out the fantasy hot local soldier in my area fighting zombie realness? It's about the cuntiest thing Chris has done in the story so far. Past where we get the Magnum, Chris hears a groan and some change dragging in the distance. have such sights to show you. At the top of this path is a little cabin, a cozy little getaway with the magic box, a typewriter, and most importantly, a crank. Before making a swift exit, Chris finds he is not alone in this cabin, and in fact might even be pulling a year next. 
Aaron shows up looking grotesque. This is Lisa Trevor, a monstrously mutated woman hunched back with her hands in shackles. With no means to kill her, we politely leave her lovely home and head back towards the mansion. Maybe this calls for the letter Kitty leave. No. Letter Kitty leave? Back in the room with the supplies was another set of double doors. Going that way, we get a radio call from Brad Vickers, the helicopter pilot who left us to rot. Apparently, he had a change of heart. It isn't all that helpful, though, as the radio Richard gave us is one of the ones Colonel Mustard sold secondhand on the black market. I stole essential Air Force radio parts, and I sold them on the black market. That is how I made all my money. We find ourselves upon a path completely submerged in a tank of water. There's also a nearby device saying that the water can be drained, but only if you had a crank. Using the crank Chris found in the little cabin, the water is drained and we're good to move forward. We head down an elevator to find a waterfall as well as another elevator, but this one is missing a battery. There's a gated area nearby. Let's see if the battery is hiding behind it. No battery yet, but we have found a whole new area, the guardhouse. A series of rooms much smaller than the mansion for the protagonist to explore. Chris stocks up in the save room and heads towards an open door in the residence until a tentacle leaps from the floor and nearly drags him down under. Let's just cover that up real quick. Making a house call to room 002, we find the key to room 001 in the bathroom. He also snoops and finds a document about a bad mamma jamma named Plant 42, because 42 is the answer to life. Apparently this plant is big and taking over this evil residency. Moving some bookshelves out of the way reveals a hole in the floor. Down we go. It's giving underground bunker. Chris finds his way across any obstacle until reaching a flooded aqua ring and reuniting with Richard. He seems shaken. In this flooded area is a literal zombie shark and Bruce is hungry for some dick. The shark lunges out of the water and eats Richard, dragging him down below the water, only leaving a bloody pool in his wake. Oh, Neptune. We can't get into the power room yet, so let's go explore room 001 since we found that key. Still pretending he's the next contestant on Room Raiders, Chris finds what the horrors of becoming a zombie can lead a person to, as well as a dinky little pistol. In the bathroom, we find ourselves the key to the control room. Lots of bathroom-based keys in this section. Before we jump the shark, literally, let's take a pit stop into the last room we haven't checked out yet. Giant spiders, okay, moving on. Some oil lamps that when lit reveal a special symbol. This definitely will come into play at some point. There's also a red book in here. He has to return to the library to avoid paying those inflated overdue book fees. Now that we have the control room key, let's go pull an Ian Ziering on this Sharknado. Chris tries to drain the water, but the shark does not like that and causes the room to go on lockdown. We've got to get these shutters closed fast or we're fucked. Overriding the safety protocols, he gets the shutters to close and successfully drains all the water. We find a much better shotgun, but old Neptune here still has a little bit of life left in her. So, to finish her off, he drops a generator into the water and... Pull the lever, crunk. Fries her ass out of the equation, finally allowing Chris to get the gallery key. Chris can't help but notice there's a room in the aqua ring completely overrun by Plant 42. We will definitely be making a mental note of this. We interrupt this playthrough of Resident Evil to give you Shadows of Evil from Black Ops 3 because we just found a fumigator and we have some pods to harvest. We murder all the pesky insects and can now navigate the gallery worry-free. We nab the key to room 003, but before we use it, there's a door with a lock pad having three symbols on it. The oil lamps. Using the symbols we saw from the oil lamps and how it correlates to the balls on the pool table, we find the code to be 536 and hack our way in. Inside, there's all sorts of beakers and chemicals, but Chris... I don't know shit about fuck. So he can't mix any of them. Hi, Evan here. I am editing and recording the voiceover for this video. So apparently, I have just discovered that because we saved Richard back in the mansion, he lived long enough to have this sh hero moment with the shark encounter, which is how we got the assault shotgun. But apparently, if we wanted to get Rebecca to make the V-Jolt, we would have had to let Richard perish back in the mansion. So at this point, we could take control of Rebecca and make the V-Jolt. I did not know that going into this playthrough. I almost always play as Jill. So... V-Jolt is officially not canon, I fear, in Chris's scenario. I declare it.
We head into room 003 and find a slot to put that red book in we found earlier. Doing a little zoning reveals Plant 42. Chris gets grabbed by the rabid plant monster and hoisted into the air, tossed around that room like the visiting DL daddy did to me in his hotel room. Chris blasts the monster out of existence using that newfound shotgun and finds the helmet key. Back to the mansion. On the way there, he meets up with Rebecca, and Chris has to relay the news that Richard is dead, and he feels guilty, being the canonical first in a long, long line of men getting killed while under Chris's command. We also run into Wesker, who we haven't seen since the beginning of the game. He says him and Jill got separated, so we have no idea where she is. He commands Chris to keep investigating the mansion. Before going all the way back, we remember our mental note of there being a room overrun by Plant 42 in the Aqua Ring. Well, now that Plant 42 is Plant Negative 42, let's check to see if there's anything exciting in that room. Oh. Oh. Absolutely nothing? What? There's nothing in this room. Hmm. Back in the mansion, we find there are now these reptilian creatures called Hunters lurking around. They were a Terror Alert Orange! We use the helmet key on this door right by where we burned the upstairs map into a hunk of wood. Chris either photographically memorized or is crotch walking out of the Spencer Mansion with it. There's a room in which the walls start closing in on Chris. Luckily, to avoid becoming Peter Strom, we push the statue into the hallway, run around behind the wall pulleys and push a switch to reset. Before they can close in on us again, Chris pushes the statue into its rightful place to stop the death trap and get access to some hole. In the hole is another lame book with a medallion of an eagle inside. Reading a note right in front of us fills us in a little bit more on the Trevor family. See, George Trevor was contracted to build the mansion we are currently trying to navigate around. He was sought out for his usage of traps, secret passages, and other elaborate video game-esque features he liked to install in his architecture. His wife Jessica and daughter Lisa moved here while he worked, but his manager never had intentions of letting any of them leave. Beyond his grave, we find ourselves in a dank little corridor. Giant spiders running amok. Chris flips the fuse to get the mansion elevator back online while also unlocking that door in the basement kitchen from way long ago. Taking the elevator up brings Chris to a new area of the mansion that loops back by the save room with the medicine. Before charting back to familiar territory though, we explore the other door by the elevator which leads us to the battery. Since we are so close to the save room, let's use the helmet key on this door right upstairs that has a very attentive eagle inside. Flipping off the lights and getting in his blind spot reveals some gems Chris can yoink out of the mountain animal heads. There's also a note from Umbrella Headquarters informing of something called Tyrant. Revisiting our kitty girl in the narrow hallway, we can finally feed it the yellow glass eye it's always dreamed of, scoring us something called an MO disc. A real piece of 1996 hardware, and this is umbrella grade. Ain't no Radio Shack here. Back in the mansion foyer, we had another door locked by the helmet key. Investigating in there leads to a note warning Chris about an evil painting of the mansion in the back of the art room. This is actually informing us that way back in the storage room where we found our first defense item, there is a painting there and on New Game Plus runs, we can actually use the closet key to go in that room and change costumes mid-game. A pretty neat feature you just don't see much more of these days. We also find a jewelry box. Combining the red gem with the jewelry box causes all the pieces to fall out and for us to solve a little puzzle, literally. Doing so grants us the Spencer family brooch, which is also a key to the only door that has the same symbol on it. Once inside, Chris immediately hears Rebecca scream. Uh-oh, time to play the hero, despite what that DLC that came out 20 years later would be called. She's in the room directly above us, the one where we found the dog whistle. We're about to bust in right on time. Always on time. To save her from being slashed by a hunter. Continuing back onto our investigation of the Spencer office reveals a metal object, similar to the stone and metal object we found earlier, but with no metal frame. Now, it's time to go fuck up a snake. In the room where we almost got killed attempting to grab the armor key, there's actually another well-hidden door behind the key that can be opened with the helmet key. It's our final locked door in the mansion, so we throw the key away. In here, we face off against Yawn, this time for the last time. As the snake goes out, it throws a hissy fit and knocks into a large wooden case, revealing to Chris 
the wolf metal. Now with the battery in both metals intact, we set back towards the waterfall. We put the battery in, which allows us to use this alternate elevator. When we initially used the crank and drained the water, Chris noticed the sound of a waterfall, meaning if we put the water back, the waterfall must stop and we can get through. Going immediately through the first door we see leads to a shaft. We also find Enrico Marini down here, another member of Bravo team. He's in rough shape. He seems pissed by our appearance. He manages to say something about a double crosser and umbrella just before getting shot by someone just out of view. Who could the traitor be? Chris notices Enrico was holding a different crank. This elemental wand controls the rocks down here in the cave. What's this? A flamethrower? Oh boy but if we take it it will lock the doors meaning this flamethrower is not a permanent present instead chris gets to live his best indiana jones fantasy before reaching black tiger a giant spider boss i have an inkling we should use that flamethrower hundreds of hours playing zetsubo no shima pays off as we have to knife the webs off this door to proceed chris ditches the empty flamethrower dodges another boulder instead of punching it rearranges some furniture and finds the cock ring to the shaft Combining the cylinder and the shaft allows the spelunking elevator to regain power. Riding it down brings Chris to an area where he has to push a big wooden box onto a gondola and let it ride. We trail it back to a large trash compactor that we can use to break open this crate and see what goodies lie inside. It's another flamethrower, but broken. What happens next is Chris has to do a step straight out of the buried Easter egg, in which he has to pull a switch on the cave wall to temporarily reveal these hooks to place the flamethrower on. Meanwhile, Leroy Trevor here follows us around trying to end our plight, which unlike sorority sister Lois, she is not very sensitive to. Inside the room that unlocks leads to some more tragic revelations about the Trevor family. Lisa lived down in this place. She was separated from her parents, who were then killed, and she lived as a lab experiment to Umbrella. She took the face of her dead mother and fused it with herself so she could always be with her. And now, with a ludicrous amount of the T-virus in her, she roams the grounds in pain and never at rest. Chris also robs her jewelry box, which gets us the stone ring, which looks like it would fit perfectly around the metal object we obtained earlier. Doing exactly that and grabbing the first stone and metal object we used to open up the area leading to the guardhouse allows us to place both stone and metal objects in the basement doors to the mansion, leading to the secrets that lie beneath. Chris stumbles upon Wesker, who is in the middle of fighting Lisa Trevor. Chris manages to open the tomb in the middle of the room, revealed to be the corpse of Jessica Trevor, Lisa's mother. She grabs her skull and jumps off the ledge, plummeting to her death. Unfazed by the tragic events of the Trevor family that just enfolded in front of him, Christopher pushes on to a large fountain. This is where those wolf and eagle medals we found earlier come into play. Placing them drains the fountain and reveals a hidden staircase to a laboratory. Classic Resident Evil remake, ending in a laboratory segment. Also, I'm fairly certain that if you were playing this on GameCube or PS2, this is where it would ask you to switch to Disc 2. We find a second MO disc and make our way into a room where Chris gets to play Grey's Anatomy for a second. And scene. Chris's acting debut reveals a password, cell. He'll keep that in mind. In an operations room, Chris finds a note revealing that what the hell that scary red zombie that popped out of the coffin was. Those are crimson heads, zombies that when unconscious mutate rapidly and get even deadlier, growing sharper teeth and claws, as well as taking a little bump of whatever Usain Bolt is mainlining and getting a speedy upgrade. In a foreshadowing turn of events, the password to this umbrella computer is John and Ada. Remember those names because we will be revisiting them in the next entry of this franchise. We use the computer to unlock both basement level doors using the password cell we obtained from playing doctor like Drake and Josh. You can't impersonate a doctor. It's against the law. And head on our merry little way. In the B2 door we just unlocked is a third and final MO disc, as well as a projector revealing some information about enemy types we've seen so far, as well as a visual for another name we've been hearing getting thrown around, the Tyrant. There's also an enlightening image of the Bioorganic Weapons Research Group Development Staff for Umbrella. 
and it would appear as if the sunglass-wearing motherfucker Albert Wesker is in the picture. He's the double-crosser. This conspiracy might just be bigger than we think. We also learned in this room that this lab has some hefty safety protocols when warning us of all the emergency procedures. In a B3 lab room, Chris finds a fax from Umbrella HQ stating that the experiments here have gotten out of control and are running loose through the property, as we've noticed. The fax also mentions that they anticipate STARS and the RPD responding first and to take measures against our arrival. This room has a device that will overwrite and transmit the data on one of those pesky MO disks with information we need. Using the slide filter found in this room reveals the passcode we need to access that little room giving us the power area keys, as well as finally letting us watch some POV of what happened to Kenneth, the dude who was getting his face ripped off in the iconic opening. Behind the other door the power area key opens is a Camara-filled wig that we have to work our pussy out, okay honey? Here's what needs to be done. Firstly, we must pop in our last MO disc, lighting the green light to finally open up whatever lies beyond those three switches. Then, we must run a suicide mission to transport a live fuel source that will explode if Chris fires his weapon, gets hit by an enemy, or runs. So, the snail race is on. But before we take on that Mission Impossible, we pull the three switches opened by the MO discs and find none other than Jill Valentine locked up in a jail cell. Unfortunately, her cell door is still locked, so we're going to have to find another way to save the day. Fun fact, I am still haunted by this section of the game because when I was trying to platinum this game, I was going for the achievement to complete the entire game without saving, aka dying. Otherwise, you would have to start over from the very beginning. Well, I forgot to clear out every single zombie and torch them, so on my walk back to place the fuel lodge, a crimson head came to life, hit me once, and caused me to blow up, ending my run literally five fucking minutes away from seeing the credits roll. I was so pissed and literally did not touch this game for years. Even better is while I was recording this very video and writing this script, I set the controller down to smoke and when I came back, my stoned ass forgot what I was doing and immediately started running and blew myself up. At least then I had just saved, right? Like, so I didn't have that much to redo, just this lab section a little bit. Anyway, back to drag story time. Chris edges death by walking the tightrope with the fuel in his inventory, which allows him to power up the main elevator. It's time to blow this popsicle stand. Rebecca catches up with us to see our mission through to the end. We catch Wesker in the midst of his evil doings, but this cat's out of the bag, so Wesker isn't trying to hide anything. Wesker has always been with Umbrella. The entire idea of the STARS unit was started by Umbrella so they could be in control of what this task force even did. Wesker shoots Rebecca in the chest, and Wesker finally shows off the Tyrant, a giant, superhuman-looking motherfucker with Madonna arms who gives no fucks about humans whatsoever. The Tyrant breaks out of his tube and immediately impales Wesker, the man who created it. He really is a superior life form. Chris pumps a round of magnum bullets into the tyrant, which seems to take it down. He checks on Rebecca, and luckily she is wearing a bulletproof vest, so she's mostly all right. Wesker... Yeah, and he died like a pussy. And we read a note he was holding talking about some woman named Alexia and an entirely different virus called the G-Virus, signed by somebody named William Birkin. Upon heading back down the elevator, Rebecca suggests that we should blow up the place because there is a ton of T-Virus still in this mansion. Chris is immediately on board with the Boom Booms. With the self-destruction system active, that means all the doors in the facility have been opened for evacuation purposes, which means we can set Jill free. With Jill on our side, we head for the helipad on the roof of the Spencer Mansion. With only three minutes on the clock, Rebecca and Jill offer to hold back the monsters headed this way, while Chris books it to the roof to fire off a flare and signal Brad that we need extraction. Just as the rocket shoots up, so does the tyrant, immediately attacking the three remaining STARS members. It's the final showdown, baby. Everyone is firing whatever guns they have at the tyrant in an attempt to kill the fucker. At the last second, Brad throws down a rocket launcher from the helicopter above. Chris takes aim and blows the tyrant into a million little pieces. As the team flies away into the sunset, the mansion explodes. And that's the end of Chris's story. Let's take a look at Jill's. 
Jill's story is not all that much different from Chris's. The story is largely the same, but with some character-specific tweaks and gameplay advantages. Gameplay-wise, Jill has eight inventory slots instead of six. She also doesn't have the lighter by default like Chris did. Instead, she has the lockpick, allowing us to not even bother with old keys as we can just use the lockpick tool to break our way in. Jill also has slightly less overall health than Chris, so you may find yourself healing a lot by playing as her. Jill also has the advantage of being Jill fucking Valentine, serving it to you Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Come on, I know you are gagging for mother cunt 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 cuntress, please, bitch. Story-wise, since we are now playing as Jill, it only makes sense that Chris would be the one to be in an unknown location. Wesker still runs in the mansion foyer with us, but there's somebody new here. Barry Burton, also an ex-Air Force girly, having served in the same unit as Chris. Hence Barry saying that him and Chris share a certain history. Jill starts off in the dining room while Wesker fucks off somewhere else, but Barry stays with her for this part of the investigation. Barry notices a fresh blood stain by the fireplace and tells Jill to look around, hoping this isn't Chris's blood. We get to see the iconic first zombie reveal in all its glory. Similar to Chris, we nope out of there back into the dining room, leading Barry to dome the bitch with his iconic signature magnum. We run back to the foyer to report this incident to Wesker, and he takes notice that the zombie got up and ran back into the other room. In the foyer, Wesker is nowhere to be found, so Barry and Jill decide to split up and each take a different side of the mansion. Barry then gives Jill her precious lockpick, because after all, in addition to being the mother country's icon Jill fucking Valentine, she's also... The master of unlocking, take it with you. For the sake of recording this footage, I also decided to properly convey Jill's fat pussy energy to the fullest, and I am on New Game Plus with some of the Cuckoo Bananas weapons. Anyway... So just like before, we get the map in the pot and clean house around the mansion. She uses the arrowhead to open the tomb. When playing as Jill, there's no need to do the whole broken shotgun shenanigans because Barry will just come in and save Jill from becoming a sandwich. Close one. A second late, you would have fit nicely into a sandwich. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right. Shortly after, in the foyer, Jill has another run-in with Barry, and he gives her something called acid rounds. Hmm, this doesn't look like anything we saw with Chris. This time, when we go to make the evil bee and get the wind crest, Barry is in there. He hands us a file written by one Martin Crackhorn, who definitely isn't a Roger persona. When Jill goes to the area where Chris found Forrest, she won't find him there, but instead... A grenade launcher. See, she may be carrying around this rocket launcher, but I don't even understand how she got there because Jill went through TSA and then when she asked if she was carrying any weapons, Jill responded, just this bomb ass pussy. Jillian also happens to have the piano fingers of Lady Gaga and is able to bang out a perfect Moonlight Sonata first try and get us the gold emblem. I'm noticing for the first time that all of these puzzles, Chris had Rebecca there to help him out and drop hints for all the solutions. Meanwhile, Jill put her heart, soul, and whole into figuring it out and right away just going to show that the men are flops and the women in the series are smart as fuck and could easily make it out alive. Anyway, this time around, when we go to grab the death mask that Jan is protecting, Richard will bust in with his shotgun and distract the snake for us. If we leave the room, we will hear Richard's cries of anguish, and when we go back inside, He's not there, meaning in this scenario, Richard meets his fate via a fatal yawn. If Jill gets poisoned, she will know she's poisoned, but not pass out like little bitch Chris, so she has to go shoot that shit herself. Jill places the four death mask and rocks the crimson head just as Chris did. On the way to the cabin in the woods, instead of a transmission from Brad, we hear Barry over the radio warning of a monster with chains. Jill's run-in with Wesker at the residence is quite different than Chris's. She overhears Barry and Wesker talking about some kind of deal they have. It sounds shady boots for sure. Inside room 002, Jill confronts Barry about the conversation he was just having and dead ass, Barry tries to blame it on old age and that he's talking to himself. His sweaty palms ass swiftly leaves. Since there's no Richard to jump in front of the shark, we just get a Jaws POV shot of Neptune coming right for us. Crazy how the very first sin was a woman who ate. A woman who ate. Since Jill is also a boss-ass bitch of a chemist, we can actually mix the V-Jolt. Remember that room in the aqua ring we found as Chris that seemingly had no value? Finally, our lives have 
purpose. And this is the room where Plant 42's roots are exposed, meaning we can use the V-Jolt to weaken it. The peeling! Plant 42 is noticeably weakened when we arrive, but it still manages to grab us into the air. Luckily, Mr. Burton comes in with a flamethrower and saves the day. Plant 42 is no more. There is no boss fight required. Thanks, Vigil. Jill scores the helmet key and heads back to the mansion. Another small difference here is that Jill can actually use these double doors, since Barry just burst through them to save us. Barry is stronger than Chris, confirmed? Does that mean Barry Burton could also punch a boulder? The encounter Jill has with Wesker in the hallway while returning to the mansion plays out similarly to how it did with Chris, but he starts sowing some seeds to continue that narrative that Barry might be off his rocker. Because yeah, the very first thing was a woman who ate. A woman who ate. Jill's encounter with Enrico goes more swimmingly than Chris's does. He is alive for longer and is more forward with her. Enrico says, Umbrella set us up, and there's a traitor in the mix. He is then shot by an unseen Wesker, and we carry on. This time in the caves, there's no flamethrower because Barry brought it back to the Plant 42 fight. So that means Jill is raw dog and a black tiger. After we deal with the shaft, Barry jumps on the spelunking elevator with us. Once at the bottom, he says Jill should investigate and he'll keep watch. After an encounter with Miss Lisa Trevor, we find Barry pulling a real Letterkenny leave on us and ditching us with the elevator. The Lisa Trevor fight is very different from how it went down with Chris and Wesker. This time, Jill knows something is really off with Barry. And with all this talk about a traitor, Jill suspects the worst. Jill manages to pull Barry's own gun on him and demands an explanation. With a classic, no time, Lisa Trevor shows up and Barry asks you to give him his gun. We as the player actually have a real-time choice to make. Do we give him the gun back? Do we trust him? If we don't, Lisa will knock Barry off the edge, sending him to his death. But she keeps his gun, one of the best guns in the game. That is not the canon course, however, so Jill holds out hope that her partner is not a traitor and gives him his gun back, allowing him to be the distractor while we push the stones off and open the coffin. Talking to Barry afterward results in him wanting to stay behind. Seems like a pretty goddamn good time to start explaining some shit, but I guess the exposition can wait. After uploading all the MO disc, it only makes sense that Chris is the one locked away in the cell this time. Barry joins us before heading up to the lab for the tyrant reveal. This is where some dots finally start getting connected. Barry pulls the gun on us and it seems like Wesker and Barry are working together. It isn't as black and white as it seems though. Wesker is forcing Barry to be his henchman. He threatened to kill his two daughters, Polly and Moira, if he didn't cooperate. But Barry's a good guy at heart and he didn't like doing all of the slimy things Wesker made him do. So Barry shoots Wesker and the tyrant unleashes. Instead of impaling Wesker like the tyrant did with Chris, he just bitch slaps Wesker and Barry like Danielle Basuti in Insidious 2. Don't you dare! Wesker appears pathetically dead after the first tyrant fight, but Barry is all right, as the body is gone like he was freaking Ghostface. This time, it would appear that the self-destruct sequence has initiated by itself. Must have been that pesker Wesker. Jill frees Chris from his cell and we book it to the helipad. With three minutes on the clock, Jill races to the roof to light the signal flare because Chris needs to have his moment. Good. Jill? Ladies first. Chris! Would you let me have my moments too? I would like to take this moment to formally state on the record that I believe Chris is canonically gay. There is no concrete evidence whatsoever in this franchise that points towards a specific sexuality for him, but it's just so much more fun to imagine that he's in the alphabet community, okay? Stick with me here for this franchise, and I promise I will go into more in-depth detail that isn't just, ee, he said a feminine thing, or, oh my god, he's so hot, so I hope he's gay. Chris Redfield is a complex and well-developed character, and after all these years, if you ask me, he has the common behavior exhibited by us girls, so I strongly believe Chris is colorful as a Fabergé egg, okay? Consider this the first in a series of evidence towards my case. The team takes on the tyrant, and Brad throws the rocket launcher to us at the last second. Taking aim at the tyrant, we blow it up and let- Wait, what the fuck? It's sliding it out of the way. What are we going to do? How do we beat him this time? Just kidding. We whack him on the second go. The team flies off into the sunset, and the credits roll. And that's the story of Resident Evil 1 Remake. I think this game is absolutely incredible and a masterclass of survival horror, not to mention a high standard for what a remake should be. This game really polished up and gave the original a fresh coat of paint while also injecting a new life into areas by adding more detail to the level design and puzzle work. 
This is a game I will always enjoy revisiting and is easily one of my favorites in the franchise. This is a game that was extremely well thought out and does a great job at what it sets out to do. The whole game is basically a puzzle comprised of a bunch of smaller puzzles with some zombie combat in between. This game's story is significantly more isolated and small scale than the rest of the franchise, as to be expected for the first entry. As for the story itself, since there are multiple endings and scenarios, I've chosen to describe the canon story here. This is why I didn't mention the multiple ways Rebecca can be left to die, or even some of the main characters dying. Since Jill and Chris more or less experienced the same events, I sort of interpret this as both being canon, almost like they were happening at the same time. At the end of the day, Chris, Jill, Rebecca, and Barry went through some horrific shit at the Spencer Mansion and found themselves way in over their heads by joining stars, and they didn't even know it. After fighting off a ton of B.O.W.s and finding out their leader is a fraud, they narrowly escape the mansion before it explodes. We will revisit all of these characters again as we continue with the franchise. Well, my creamies, that is all for the drag story time I have for you today. If you enjoyed this video, I would love for you to subscribe and stick around the channel. I am cooking up some great stuff up here and want to share it with you all. If you like horror, video games, nerd shit, and drag, follow me on Instagram at queen underscore cream for all the updates on life and what I'm doing, where I'm performing. Working the Lore Corner is a series I have been wanting to start up for a long time, and I'm glad to finally be out here covering some of my favorite media. I want to do this series on more than just video games. Movies, TV shows are totally on the table. So comment what you want to hear me serve you the fairy tale of next. I'm Queen Cream. Until next time, bye-bye.